now, so we should be good. Thanks, Sydney. Are you our technical host for the evening? I am. Awesome. So I'll call to order the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for November 14th, 2022. Um, and before we get started with our business, I'll turn it over to Sydney for some ground rules. Okay, so uh, we are pleased to have you join us to strike a balance between meaningful, transparent engagement and online security. The following rules will be applied for this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak at, that meet, at the meeting. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers or presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The Q&A function is enabled and it will be used for individuals to communicate with the host. It should be used for technical online platform related questions only. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. And then just a friendly reminder to those of you who are joining us uh, with your phone, if you press star nine, you can raise and lower your hand. And if you press star six, you can mute and unmute. Thanks, Sydney. Our second item on the agenda today is the approval of minutes. We have a couple that we need to get to first, the ones from September of this year, and then the ones from last month. Do any tab members have any edits for either of those? Awesome. Can we? Um, Natalie and I made a quick last minute change on one. Now, do you want to say anything about that or do we need to bring, read it into the record? Um, you can read it into the record, I think. Okay, let me find it in the email. Tila, um, Tila's trying to say something, I think, but she's muted. Pushed on mute, but <laughs> I was just wondering, is this separate from the email that you sent us about, I don't know, that Meredith sent us about two hours ago? Yes, um, okay. this is a small edit in that section and it says, Stifler, not aware of details of Weinheimer's ethics concerns after returning from leave, had several one-on-one -on -one conversations since and trying to go forward in an ethical candid manner. Um, now I had a brief chat to clarify some things and it's not all that probably doesn't read that differently than what was in the packet. Okay. Uh, just wanted to flag that. In addition to the ones that I submitted via email earlier. Uh, so we'll do these one at a time. Um, can I get a motion to approve the September minutes if there are no subsequent requests? I move to approve the September minutes as amended. Attorney seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous with five votes. And now for the October minutes, any- I move to approve the October minutes. Thanks, Tila. I second. Trinity with the second. All those in favor? Unanimous with five votes. Thanks. Third agenda item is public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak to the Transportation Advisory Board about a, a transportation topic will have three minutes to do so. If you're interested in speaking to us tonight, please use the, the raise hand feature uh, in the, the Zoom platform and our, our technical host will be able to unmute you for your three minutes of uh, public comment. I'll note that tonight we are having a public hearing on the Transportation Improvement Program so if you're here to speak about that specific item, we'll have a, an opportunity for public comment um, momentarily on, on that. 
So feel free to raise your hands now if you're interested in speaking during public comment. I'm not seeing any hands Samir. Oh, Lynn Siegel. Yeah, Lynn, I've been missing the um, Excel Energy Partnership meeting because of this, and I'd really rather that you have the uh, disclaimer about comments offline, you know, have have people somehow set that up so it's not wasting my time, because I need to be at that meeting and this meeting at the same time, and I'm just watching the same old stuff. Um, not only that, when you do that at the beginning of the meeting, and then 15 minutes later, you do public comment, no one's going to have seen it anyway. So somehow get it online and then have people just say yes or something to it. Like, it's just a waste of time. Um, I wanted to bring up about Sombrero um, Marsh issue today because um, there was a special meeting on this and this brings to mind the, and I sent you a long letter um, yesterday or Sunday, you should have gotten it, <laughs> about how the different boards need to be on track with each other, need to be coordinating a integrated approach to planning, which everything is very interrelated. You know, and if you can't figure out how it's interrelated, then you need to think more because it absolutely is. And for example, I went to the Sierra Club breakfast. I'm very upset at Sierra Club because they supported CU South. Look, um, I mean, expansion um, and, you know, transportation, it's going to be a nightmare for that with just adding a huge population to Boulder. That's the biggest thing coming down. Um, I'm just praying that something that some ballot measure can be put on for the open the, for the disposal of the of the open space for that project. But you should be doing everything you can to stop that from being able to happen. It's basically an illegal, the whole thing is completely illegal, went below the radar, was a, an agreement, just like Excel Energy, the partnership. It's hor horrific to have to go to that tonight because we worked so hard for municipalizing and, and getting this thing under Boulder's control. Um, and there are so many interrelated things. Um, for example, Sombrero March, people were complaining about the open space board, hadn't even heard about it. I'd been to planning board meetings September 6th, and I knew all about it. And then they say, well, someone on the board said, well, I think that's a transportation issue. So the transportation board should be involved with it. 63rd Street's going to have a lot more activity on it. And that's impactful to um, the Sombrero March and the natural habitat for that area. So that's how, for example, how Transportation Advisory Board interacts with OSBT. And OSBT didn't even know about it and Planning Board had been entertaining it. So these things really need to be integrated. Um, and I guess my time's up, bye. Thanks for joining us tonight, Lynn. Good luck with the other meeting. Anyone else wishing to speak during public comments? Seeing no other hands raised, I'll close public comment and we'll move to agenda item four, which will be a public hearing where TAB will be asked to provide a recommendation to council on the transportation improvement program, also known as TIP, call number four projects. Um, staff will be giving us a, a presentation after which members of the board will have an opportunity to ask clarifying questions We'll then open it up for a public hearing for any members wishing to speak for up, up to three minutes and then TAB will begin our deliberation. So I'll welcome Valerie Watson for the presentation. Thanks. Okay. All right, let me know if you're not seeing the presentation. It's up. All right. Good evening, members of TAB. Valerie Watson, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Boulder, joined tonight by Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer. 
This evening, we'll focus in on our staff recommendations for the Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, call number four. But before that, we have some updates to share on TIP call number three, and we'll conclude with project updates for call number four and seek your recommendation to council for the staff recommended projects. Now let's turn our attention to tip call three. And as a reminder, this is a regional call cycle where municipalities coordinate together on joint applications for projects of regional benefit. Last Wednesday, after the publishing of our memo for tonight's item, we received word that the Dr. Cog Subregional Forum Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC, has scored the tip call three projects from the Boulder region. We have mostly good news and a little bit of bad news. Um, they have tentatively recommended partial funding for the Diagonal Mobility and Safety Improvements Project and full funding for the Colorado 7 BRT or Bus Rapid Transit starter service from Boulder to Brighton. Unfortunately, even though it received one of the highest scores, the TAC did not recommend any funding for our joint application with Longmont for the local bat lanes and bike and ped safety improvement projects. Staff are following up to understand the rationale for the recommendations made by the TAC. And staff are also poised to repackage this application for submittal to future grant opportunities. For consideration tonight, we wish to hear from TAB your feedback on the potential to include a repackaged application as part of tip call four, considering that one of the previously recommended projects, 30th and Arapahoe intersection, is being withdrawn and we'll talk a little bit more on that in a moment. So we're tentatively considering repackaging a portion of this unsuccessful joint application for call four, leaving a majority of Boulder's scope in the application on the call three wait list. This would maximize the opportunity to achieve funding considering the competitiveness of the scope. And as we saw in that relatively high score that this did receive from the TAC. We'll summarize this all towards the end of the presentation to assist in your deliberation tonight. Okay, and then the main topic tonight, tip call four. So let's take a look at where things stand now that we've completed the required community engagement and have taken a closer look at a couple of the projects. As we shared in August and September, we have made a lot of progress with refining the design concepts for two of the staff recommended projects. Colorado 7 Arapaho and the 30th Street Multimodal Intersection and the West Colorado Avenue Multimodal Improvements Projects per tab feedback. And we'll give updates on the projects in a bit um, that are in yellow. Um, first, we'd like to offer an update on the Colorado 7 Arapaho Avenue and 30th Street Multimodal Intersection Project. Um, that's shown in red here on the screen. Staff have decided to withdraw this project from consideration as a candidate in this fourth call for projects. Since September, staff have worked to address TAB feedback and we engaged consultant assistance and worked internally to refine the conceptual design of the intersection. We were looking at how to reconfigure vehicular operations and the physical layout of the intersection to respond to your requests regarding safety for people walking and bicycling and reduce right-of-way acquisition and thereby total project cost. We discovered in this process a couple of things, namely that there are concurrent design efforts along 30th Street and Arapahoe corridors that we want to coordinate those efforts better and maximize flexibility timing-wise of designing in concert with those. Ultimately, we want to ensure the operational solutions work for both corridors and the intersection itself. Also, timeline. There are a number of intersection elements that need more in-depth study, which doesn't mesh with the timeline for this call submission. All right, so here's a map of the recommended projects shown in solid blue lines for call four. All three are on a NAMS or a CAN corridor or both, which we believe makes them highly competitive for this call and also helps us meet our council priority goals for CAN connectivity. Let's take a quick look at the community engagement that we conducted since the last TAB meeting in October. We sent out mailers to folks in the project areas, produced project fact sheets and informational videos, and posted all of this on the city's webpage. 
There, we offered an online feedback form and virtual appointments for office hours with staff. We also sent out a city press release and social media. From this engagement, we got a range of comments and some core themes emerged. Across the projects, respondents expressed the desire for more protection at crossings and intersections for people walking and bicycling, and the desire to see more separation from vehicles for people bicycling. Folks also expressed a desire for improved transit facilities. A few comments mentioned support for these projects with the caveat that there be attention paid to ensuring adequate traffic flow. Overall, broad support for the project concepts. Also, we asked respondents to indicate how they typically travel, mainly to get a sense for the spread of responses, and we saw participations from um, all modes of travel. Next, let's look at the staff recommended projects a little closer and some updates since we last looked in detail with you in September. As a quick refresher, the projects recommended by staff for this fourth tip call for projects complete key connections along the CAN, especially 30th, Colorado, and Folsom. When you consider our tip efforts across calls two, three, and four, we're making a concerted effort to secure a funding future for good portions of the CAN. And when you look at where projects have been recently implemented or are in final design, shown on the map here in salmon, green, and light blue, even more of the network is being addressed with our current call for pursuits. All right, let's look at Colorado. For this call cycle, we're looking at the west side of this corridor with both the West Colorado project from Folsom to Regent, shown in solid blue here, as well as the pre-design application for Folsom, shown in dash blue. Since we last presented on this project, staff have refined the concept design to reconfigure roadway layout and lane striping, incorporating previous tab feedback. This has reduced the needed right-of-way acquisition and thereby the total project cost. So we're down from 5 million now at 3.6 million. We also received feedback from the Dr. Cog Subregional Forum Technical Advisory Committee at their meeting last week. Various cities were allowed to present on one abstract each and staff put this abstract forward for feedback. The TAC gave favorable comments on the project in general. They also raised that a financial partnership with CU Boulder would increase the competitiveness of this application even more. Additionally, TAC commented that the physical proximity to Folsom Field, which draws visitors from far and wide, makes this a project that has a unique opportunity to showcase a multimodal street. Staff were encouraged to make note of both of these points in our eventual application narrative. And I just want to pause here. We realize that members of TAB may not have seen the notification of this tax session by Boulder County. These meetings are usually held on the second Monday of the month, um, but this one was rescheduled um, to last Thursday. So just want to make note of that. All right, and here's a rendering of what that project is now looking like. The large image is looking east along Colorado at Folsom, and Franklin Field, the smaller field, is on the bottom left corner of the image. Then the detail of the transit superstop is looking west between Regent and Folsom. Lastly, there's a small street corner detail image um, that shows the northwest corner of Folsom. Um, it shows the new curb alignment and design elements there. I'll just pause if anyone wants to take a look here. All right, so moving on for the 30th Street Corridor, the segment of focus, it's Colorado to Baseline. And as a refresher, we're currently constructing improvements along 30th from Arapaho to Colorado, and we were funded for 30th from Arapaho all the way up to the diagonal in Call 2. And as a reminder, this project will construct raised protected bicycle lanes and improve sidewalks. And we're at a total project cost of 7.3 million for this application. For Folsom Street, we're looking at the CAN identified segment between Pine to Colorado, meeting up with the existing protected bicycle lane and crossing improvements north of this segment between Pine and Belmont. We're excited about how this application for Folsom will allow us to secure a process for this CAN priority corridor and free up those local dollars for more immediate needs on Baseline and IRIS. And we're looking at a $1.5 million project cost for this pre-design effort. Right, now let's talk about next steps. 
Tonight, we request your recommendation to council. Then on December 1st, we'll visit council for public hearing and their official endorsement. And then we'll assemble the applications by the January 2023 20, deadline. All right, so here's the recommended motion language for tab consideration, a motion to recommend that city council approve the proposed submittal by staff. Although not discussed in the memo, we mentioned earlier the disappointing news that our joint application with Longmont for the diagonal in call three looks to be not recommended for funding. So after discussion with tab tonight, staff would like the flexibility to repackage and submit that application as well, along with the three staff recommended projects on the screen here. We recognize that TAB hasn't had a lot of time to consider this, but we wanted to make sure to raise it tonight so it can be considered as part of our council recommendation. At this time, staff are considering focusing in on one intersection from that unfunded joint Longmont Boulder Call 3 project, Canyon and 28th Street, and submitting an application for transit signal priority or TSP at this location. And that would be in the ballpark of around 800,000. The remainder of the call three scope for the Boulder portion um, of that application would remain on the call three wait list. So that's our proposed strategy at the moment. Longmont may do something similar with their components of the application. They may repackage a portion or all of their, um, their bit for the application in call four. Again, with the scoring so high in tax recommendations for call three, we're looking to be nimble given this late breaking information and maximize our chances as a city for funding the scope across both calls. With that, we appreciate all of TAB's feedback to date on all things TIP, and we're now available for questions. Thanks, Valerie. Tila? Thank you, Valerie. Um, very polished and concise, thank you. Um, maybe a little bit too polished because I'm not understanding what was approved and what wasn't approved. If we can go back to the call number three projects, um, the Colorado 19 diagonal mobility and safety improvements got funded or probably will get funded, um, but the local bat lanes wouldn't. And you, in your description earlier, said the bat lanes, I think included the, maybe the bikeway. That's kind of what I'm wondering, like what are the mobility and safety improvements, or maybe we're just talking about different sections of 119. Can you tell me what got turned down so I have a better understanding of what you're repackaging? Okay, um, let me just uh, come back to the Zoom screen here one second. Okay. Um, so what I have on the screen here are the, these are the tentative recommendations of the Dr. Cog Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC. Um, they make their tentative recommendations and then the Dr. Cog Board approves those later down the road. Um, so um, typically that these recommendations usually stand. And so that's why we're you know, working from here um, as if these would be um, approved by the Dr. Cog Board. Um, so the uh, mobility and safety improvements um, for, for Colorado 119 for the diagonal was, was a Boulder County submission, um, and that did receive partial funding. Um, it involves the, the elements that you're discussing. Um, the bat lanes, um, business access transit um, lanes, also had some pedestrian and bike improvements woven in to that application, um, as, along with the bat lanes, um, which is more of a transit focused and efficiency um, component of that application, that was the one that was not recommended for any funding despite its high score. Um, and then third on the screen here is the um, Colorado 7 Arapaho BRT starter service that was fully funded um, in, in terms of the tax recommendations. Does that help clarify your question? Uh, no, um, I mean, I'm perfectly clear on what was probably funded and probably not. I'm just not sure what the difference between number one and number two here is, and particularly like what the bikeway was lumped into or not. Oh, thank you for clarifying. Garrett, may I invite you to speak to these um, these two applications? Sure. So as Valerie, and for the record, Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer, uh, as Valerie noted, the Boulder County-led application is focused on the trunk line enhancements to Colorado 119. 
And uh, it's a multi-million dollar effort that's being slowly sort of pieced together over a period of many years. This application specifically was for enhancements uh, from Niwot Road to Airport Road. And so that is the segment that the Boulder County portion is focused on. The City of Boulder and City of Longmont application was focused on providing better bikeway connections from the proposed um, CO119 bikeway to make better connections into and around the, uh, the, the, the city edges. Um, and the um, just a, a bit of a parallel, um, we know that when the 36 bikeway was uh, implemented, that one of the, the primary complaints we heard from the community was uh, we got to the edge of the town and then it just sort of gave up. And so with the 119 efforts, we are making a concerted effort to truly try to integrate uh, a connected system from the city to the trunk improvements. And that's what uh, part of this, uh, uh, the components of the bikeway of the city of Longmont City Boulder project comprised. The other was the TSP and bat lane enhancements, primarily along the segment of the diagonal um, between 28th and Foothills, as well as transit signal priority components at that intersection with 28th at the Foothills, as well as at uh, Canyon Boulevard. Okay, and so then to summarize what we're um, what you're asking us about now in terms of the potential repackaging would be that latter part that you were talking about the the transit signal priority, uh, but only at one intersection as opposed to a segment. Correct. And Valerie, I don't want to take any of your presentation away. I, I'm happy to speak to the reasoning behind that um, if you're okay with that. Please. Yes. Okay. So the the thinking on that, Tila, is that. The intersection with Canyon and 28th is geographically discrete from the rest of the segment improvements and enhancements from Iris to Foothills. And um, as well, we've got the 28th Street Bat Lanes project that uh, is hopefully going to be advertised for construction here in the next two or three weeks. And so the timing of these transit signal priority enhancements at Canyon would come uh, nicely on the heels of the construction completion of 28th Street so that we wouldn't have that sort of missing node in the, in the corridor enhancements. And also uh, the scope of the project is sort of small. And uh, a lot of times when you go through these tip uh, scoring applications, you wind up with like an extra half a million dollars where people are going, well, okay, what are we gonna do with that? And it seems like it's sort of um, uh, an advantageous way to try to um, to get a foothold in the funding opportunity for a call for because it's a, it's likely to be a small request for in, in, in making these enhancements just to the intersection at Canyon and 28th. Okay, thank you. That helps a lot. And and sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just wondering. It, I think Garrett and Valerie, you also shared with me that um, at the was it at the I don't know if it was at the sub regional forum, but um, Boulder County staff thought that it would score very highly um, in call four two. Is that right? Yes. And and I should clarify, uh, Natalie, that. That was feedback that was provided not at the TAC meeting, but uh, from Boulder County staff uh, after we got the disappointing news about the, the, the non-funding recommendation. Thanks, can you say a little bit more about what transit is being prioritized at that location and try to quantify the, the benefits of what this would get us? At the intersection with Canyon? Yes. Yes, so uh, the specifically what we are looking to implement would be for the left turning buses, they would be in, in that outside uh, GP lane on Canyon, but then the buses would be able to skip the queue and go to the front of the line and be given a specific bus left turn only phase. Um, and, then, and then they would have a receiving lane on northbound 28th for the bus lanes as well. So that, that's the primary enhancements. It's, it's signal as well as minor um, curb and gutter and, and, and street geometry revisions to accommodate the, the turn lane. Thanks, Garrett. I was just also wondering if maybe Danny or Jean could speak to um, you know, the transit service that, would, that is either there today or that would benefit from this in the future. 
Sure, this is Jean, um, Jean Sanson, City of Boulder Transportation staff. So I think as, as Tab is aware, um, this is part of the larger 119 uh, mobility and safety and bus rapid transit project. So we're looking at um, high frequency transit between um, downtown Boulder and downtown Longmont. And RTD is planning to begin to um, booster what they call the Bolt service today between Boulder and Longmont in um, preparation for full BRT service. And so like some of the elements you were looking at and you see that slide in front of you, the first project, mobility and safety improvement project, that's actually helping to fund BRT platforms and expanded park and rides um, along the trunk line, as well as pieces of um, the commuter bikeway. So this is really um, a key pinch point on that transit, on that expedited transit service that we're hoping to um, sort of unstick, if you will, within the city to expedite um, BRT transit service time so that it's competitive with the automobile. Thanks, Thanks. Any other questions from Tab? Alex, I have something. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, thank you, Valerie and team. This is this is pretty succinct and a nice presentation. Um, so I see the 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 requested action to us is to is to ideally recommend going forward as proposed here. Um, I would expect uh, council to be interested in uh, the racial equity um, or orientation of this, and I'd be curious to hear you talk about if the whether and how the way forward has um, gone through the racial equity process instrument. Um, and also just for background, and this might be beneficial to others too, but I'd certainly like to know um, to what extent does the, um, does our competitiveness or, or do, does the, do the applications themselves request information about equity or racial equity? Um, I'm just sort of curious about how our efforts on that might align with with what um, might make us more competitive, and if that's a, a place, um, I don't know where there's where there's a kind of a connectivity. So those are those are two questions. Sorry if that was a long one that I can repeat in the meeting. Um, I'm happy to speak to the the application itself. Does ask questions about the populations that will be served by the projects, and so we're able to provide data. Um, you know, a range of data points that talk about the different, um, you know, folks that would be served, um, whether it's um, economic um, data or otherwise. So that's something we do bolster um, our applications with. Um, in terms of the just the overall process, um, you know, I'll just re um, call back to some of our previous presentations on on this. Um, where you know we are essentially starting with a project list that came out of our transportation master plan. And so that would be the planning process that identified um, the potential projects that we then culled down to a list of candidates that we then reviewed with you over the last several months. Uh, yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, I think we've thought about equity as part of the criteria, right, as well. And I can't, you know, remember every little detail about that, but um, you know, I think that's part of it. And as we go forward into the future, I think we'll get even better and more robust kind of equity evaluations as part of the projects that we bring forward for TIP, um, because we'll continue to apply the racial equity instrument as part of the TMP and prioritizing projects. And so into the future, it'll just, I think that process, it will be more embedded into the work that we do to get to this point. But certainly, you know, there was, um, thinking around equity for this call for list of projects. Thank you. Does Tab have any more clarifying questions before we open up the public hearing? Not seeing any. If you'd like to address Tab about this matter, we'll have a public hearing where any members of the public are able to speak for up to three minutes. Please use the raised hand function within Zoom if you're interested in speaking. Stephen Hagel. Welcome. Okay, I think I'm working. Yep, we can hear you. 
Um, so I have a question just on the uh, 30th Street, just sort of going back to the original plans where we were keeping four lanes of traffic and expanding the right of way. Um, it seems like that was right after Folsom Street right sizing and the main goal <clears throat> that was expressed by the city was to maintain traffic speeds, uh, vehicle speeds. Is there any, so this looks like the plan on 30th is going ahead with that. Is there any like um, consideration of going down to a three lane um, configuration for that for actually decreasing traffic and probably less pollution uh, break and tire dust for the residents on 30th and not increasing the right of way, which would decrease the cost of that project probably quite a bit. Um, so that's my question is, are we just uh, going with the plan that was made probably eight years ago with changes of priority? Thanks. Does someone from staff want to answer that? I'm happy, I'm happy to take it. I was waiting to see if anyone else wanted to. Um, yeah, we would certainly, thanks for the question, Stephen. And um, it's definitely something that we've thought about. Um, we, it would be you know, a consideration as part of the design process. Assuming we get the funding, um, then it would be part of that process. Thanks, Natalie, and for the question, Stephen. Any other members of the public hoping to speak? Let's see, Kurt Nordbeck. Welcome, Kurt. Hi, Kurt Nordbeck. Uh, this is a total detail level comment and probably inappropriate, but this is my opportunity, so I'll make it. For the design of the Colorado uh, changes that was presented at Folsom, the, at the intersection of Folsom and Colorado for southbound traffic on Folsom at Colorado. Currently, there is uh, a, a no right turn on red uh, marking, which hopefully would continue. And so there's a right turn lane and there's a left turn lane, but neither one can move when the, there's red. And so you really don't need both lanes. You, it could be a combined left turn, right turn lane, um, which then would allow for a narrower crossing of Folsom. So I just want to suggest that that would be a possibility for the design. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. I think that's something I brought up briefly with, with staff. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and, and open up for uh, tab deliberation. I think to add on to Kurt's point, we're also inviting people to turn into a bus only lane, which I think will sort of make it less of a, of a respected treatment if we're, if we're inviting that kind of behavior. So yeah, I think a three to two conversion from uh, in the block approaching Folsom would would make it make it safer and and sort everyone out um, so that we're not setting people up to be in the wrong spot. Well, I came in tonight ready to support three of these. A uh, little thrown off by the the fourth one. Um, how are you all feeling, Becky? Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. I know. I likewise. I um, you know. I'm happy about the trajectory of the kind of evolution of selecting these projects. And um, I, I guess, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm supportive of what staff has proposed. I guess I'm a little unclear uh, the, the way that the, the proposed language for, for the motion is set up is we will just support the staff recommendations. So it's still kind of leading up to staff whether they wanna pursue that hybrid repackage or not, um, which I'm okay with. I also think we'd be a little, I'd feel a little on firmer ground saying we support the three uh, that were at the memo and just make no recommendation um, from tab on on this new one because we don't really know. I don't quite understand what's, what's gotten left out and what's 
um, included in the, I don't think we have a cost estimate on it, do we? But there's some information that we have on the other projects that we don't really have for that one. So um, definitely not gonna dissuade staff. I'm actually quite impressed with the nimbleness, you know, that, that this has shown, um, that you, you did come up with some idea for, for what to do after um, um, we got turned down on, on call three. Um, so I don't wanna, you know, tell you that was that was wrong. I just don't think I have enough um, information to give a, a firm recommendation for or against it. But I'm certainly happy to recommend the three that you were already prepared to do this evening. Thanks, Tila. I think the cost on that was something like eight hundred thousand, mm -hmm. which I, I, was a bit of money for a single transit intersection. I think it would mostly benefit the the Longmont bound traffic. Um, Whereas the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the inbound to Boulder traffic is just making a, a right turn where it won't meet this transit signal and, and receiving lane. So just one intersection, one way for 800,000 feels a little steep for me. So I'm a little reluctant mm -hmm. on that one. It, I mean, it is a pretty novel treatment for the bus only left turn lane. I, I'm appreciative of that as well. I, I haven't experienced that. I know that I've seen pictures of it um, but I don't know if we've adopted it anywhere in Boulder or in Colorado, really. <laughs> so, um, you, you know, the, the, if that's the cost, and I didn't, I missed that number. I'm sorry, but it's not shocking to me. But again, I just don't feel firm in my details to be able to recommend it. Yeah, my biggest concern is probably, like we've seen in the past, is we, we can't control how things are scored. We can only control what we submit projects on. And I'd hate to miss out on, on Folsom because at the last minute we threw out this idea and it, our regional partners like this regional transit project more than a, a slightly more um, local street where um, we've put our efforts to so far. Trini? Well, I was just gonna add if the, um, before the council meeting, if there was any chance that we could get more information, like more specifics on this fourth one, um, so we could, we'll just make a more educated choice. Mm -hmm. The trouble with that is that to make a recommendation as tab, we need to have had the public hearing like what we did tonight. And so, you know, we could maybe <laughs> reconvene quickly on our third meet Monday or whatever, but um, we've kind of got all the, the pieces in place to make a recommendation one way or the other tonight. So we should make a recommendation one way or the other um, now. Agreed. And I think if, if we were to see any information in the, um, the council packet, we would be welcome to reach out to council in our individual capacity if, if we have a stronger understanding of, of things. Can I just offer maybe a summary? It sounds like, um, I, I, maybe not everybody, we haven't done a, a full straw poll, but it sounds like there people seem to be happy with, with the first three. And the fourth one is excitingly novel and great that staff got this together. Mm -hmm but we just you know haven't had a chance to, to yeah to thoroughly analyze it so like you said before she left that's not a that's not an affirmative or a, or a negative statement um and then yeah it goes to staff to go from there just as a message for council natalie what's your preference <laughs> my preference um so i I mean, I can understand all sides of it, I guess. I think I agree. I think this would be an exciting project. And um, and from a cost standpoint, I actually think it's probably pretty good ROI as far as um, what you're putting into it and then the eventual benefit. Um, but I can certainly, you know, I can understand also the uh, adding this into the list and then it, it just ends up competing, right? Because you're you're throwing in four projects. I mean, they're all competing with each other. So, um, yeah, I I lean towards putting it in. I think it's um, I think it's worth putting in there. And I procedurally, I was what I was thinking and was going to add is that we can um, submit all four for you know staff's recommendation to council with the caveat that tab um, their recommendations 
was for the three projects. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we can provide, in fact, I think Valerie was going to mention too, that, um, we'd love it to have, um, actually, sorry, that was not on Valerie. It it was on me to mention that we certainly would love, um, you to provide, you know, input to council, either you can come to the, that meeting or, um, or we can summarize your feedback in a slide. Um, but either way, we'll get that kind of message across to them on okay. the support. So I guess what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, does it, does it matter a whole lot to staff, whether TAB says yes on the three and no, no comment on the fourth, or would it really benefit you if we actually just said whatever staff wants to do? If it's three, it's three. If it's four, it's four. Not really even knowing if you've decided fully to put it in. Yeah, I think there's a benefit of having um, tab, tab support supporting staff for members. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once the proposals have been submitted, is there any wiggle room of saying like we we would rather have full project X over project Y, or are we kind of just beholden to however our regional peers score them? I'll let Garrett take that one. So each of the projects will be scored. And then um, the, but the, the, the region, the subregion, I should say, isn't necessarily bound to the scoring as we saw with call three. Um, so there are uh, will be uh, opportunity for us to um, insert our own preference uh, if we will find ourselves in a place where um, perhaps Canyon and 28th is funded and Folsom is scores well, but uh, it, there's not enough funding to go around. We could say we'd rather fund Folsom and then uh, we, we'd have that ability to maneuver. Okay, I think I'd, I'd feel a little more comfortable recommending the 28th and Canyon on the condition that it's the fourth priority out of the four. I don't see any downside to doing that other than being out the 20% the local match, which we might be hard to spend that more, that more effectively without a, a grant. I think I saw Valerie nodding at that suggestion, but I'm not confident. I think what we just heard is that is a possibility to do, isn't it? Can I get some confirmation of that? <laughs> I think it's what Garrett also just said. I think that allows us the flexibility to, you know, work up to the council date um, okay. to be able to, you know, provide that information at council. Um, and as Natalie mentioned, it, it, it just gives us a lot of, of flexibility we need. Um, and so I think it, any recommendation from TAB that includes this um, in some fashion would be helpful. Okay. All right, I'm trying to craft a motion here. Does anyone have any thoughts while I type? Well, I mean, just putting in the, the recommended motion language is, it just says like the, the staff, um supported the proposed submittal to the denver regional council of government so it's just supporting what staff wants to do um without yeah, really I think we call out specific projects and extents um not just a blank check sort of approach may i raise a point of order for that. Um, this is the same language that was used in the um, recommendation for call cycle two, if that helps just to provide any clarity for tab deliberation. Okay. Any other comments or can we start working on a on a motion well i'm perfectly comfortable with the proposed suggested motion language in the memo so i'm giving alex a chance to doll it up or change it specify it more but um, okay. i'll just i'll just run mostly with it and mention canon as well so mo i'll move to recommend to city council to approve the following 
core arterial network projects to the Denver Regional Council of Governments for the 2024-2027 Transportation Improvements Program sub-regional project selection process. West Colorado Avenue multimodal improvements from Regent Drive to Folsom Street, 30th Street multimodal improvements from Baseline Road to Colorado Ave, Folsom Street multimodal improvements pre-designed from Pine Street to Colorado Ave, and 28th and Canyon transit signal priority intersection improvements. No, I'm getting ready to do my video. I second the motion. Well, I wasn't done. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, with the preference that Colorado 30th and Folsom projects take priority over the 28th and Canyon project. I second the motion again. Thanks, Tila. Do we have any debate or discussion on the motion? Well, is, ha, Natalie, how does that, how do you feel about that? Well, I guess I'm just, <laughs> mostly I was just reflecting on like with staff, Garrett, Valerie, you know, the folks that are attending the sub-regional meetings, does that feel like we can work with, within those constraints, I guess, in that forum? I, I, I think so. Uh, there are any number of ways that this could play out. Um, and so, uh, and it's, it, it, there's a decent chance that this Canyon of 28th project because of its uh, location on critical regional corridors could come out to be the highest scoring project. And I can appreciate the concern that TAB would have about what that might mean for these other critically important projects on the CAN network. Um, it could play out that that would be the only project that could get funded um, out of, because uh, uh, there are several projects that uh, Boulder County has put forward uh, via the TIP abstracts. They may not submit all of them, but uh, a number of their projects uh, look like they could score very, very well if they decide to submit. Um, so we could find ourselves in a place where um, uh, we might only get one project uh, out of all of these. And um, so, it's, I think um, we know and understand what your priorities are and what, and what I think would work to uh, try to bring that to fruition through um, the machinations of, of the of working on the sub-regional um, TAC. Um, and so I, I guess um, it's, it, I, I wish I had the crystal ball to know exactly how it would play out on the scoring so I could give you a more definitive response here. Yeah, I would say, I think, you know, Tab just needs to be comfortable with like at, at a certain point, like we understand the priorities and we're going to go and represent that. And, and then it's going like the, the cards are going to fall where they may. Right. And so just making sure that you all are comfortable with that. I uh, really appreciate staff's deference to tab and your uh, collegiality with us and the respect that you've shown us at our opinions. Um, and I will just remind TAB members, we are a mere advisory board, right? <laughs> so we're giving, you know, the clearest advice we can to council, but that's all that it is. It doesn't bind anybody or anything. And so thank you staff for like really bending over backwards to accommodate our wishes and, and you know, take them seriously. But I, I, my instinct is to be a little more just, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel so worried about for number four is, is something that I need to analyze. I, I do sort of think big picture, it's a, it's a request for, you know, endorsement of the general management of the thing. And um, so I, I'm happy to go if, if tab feels like the, the more specific um, motion language feel, feels more comfortable. I'm happy to go with that, but I'm also, I'm fine with the language that staff provided originally. I, I'm kind of, I agree with Ryan. I think um, either, but I'm comfortable with what the staff provided as well. But Yeah, and I think Alex has expressed he's not quite comfortable with it, and he is comfortable with this, and I'm comfortable with both of them. And so for the sake of unanimity, not that it's, you know, an end in itself, but it might be a nice way to just 
package it up um, neatly and give staff, I think, the support that we are trying to show them. Yeah, I'm, I'm just worried about what happened in 2019, where there was a lot of local enthusiasm for 30th Street. There was more regional support for the Table Mesa overpass, and we we didn't get our our first choice, and then we had to. We, I mean, we lucked out and eventually got it, but um, I wouldn't want to set ourselves up in that position again. And so I think as people who are here to advise council on policy, I, I would think that there's a lot more opportunity, uh, especially with this council to do something that's been really challenging in Boulder, which is which is work on on Folsom. And uh, it would be a missed opportunity if, if we were to do do something that we know our, our regional supporters are in the state are eventually going to sign on to. So I'd prefer to keep the, um, the motion language is currently under consideration. Okay. I, I, I will also point out like there's nothing in the, the current motion that would prevent staff from deciding, eh, never mind, we don't want that for you know, deciding it's it that the risk of cannibalizing other options is too bad. But I'm sure we are not the only municipality that's uh doing a Hail Mary in this last round um and trying to scrape up as many dollars as they can with a variety of different projects. So I think the current motion will give staff the flexibility to do what they think is best um, and you know, recognize that we're not in control of, no one on this call is in control of how, how it plays out. So does that mean we're ready to vote on this motion? It's tough, Alex. I'm swayed by your I'm swayed by your 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 policy and strategy thinking, but I I, I think I have a slightly stronger impulse to just sort of give gives uh, staff our um my you know just sort of endorsement that they'll do their best on this with 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 the understanding that as Tila said a couple of times you know ultimately we're just advising and staff doesn't need to you know and then they're they're hearing they're hearing our, our thoughts um that they can operate with their own agency. And I didn't answer the question that was ready to vote. So I but I yeah I'm happy if it's time to vote. Are there any competing motions before we vote? No, no one's opposed no one's uh moved with the original language. Um I'm willing to see how this book comes out before I do that. Was it worth doing a Forgive my ignorance on procedure. Is it worth getting uh, understanding if people prefer which 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 of the two people prefer? I mean, isn't that sort of the question? Is mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, having heard Alex, I would hate the city to miss out on something that we want to prioritize because it's like a fourth project that's in there that's kind of vague. I don't have a really strong feeling either way. I'm kind of happy with both. Um, I'm fine with the the modification of explaining the prioritization to mm -hmm. represent that aspect of this discussion. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel strongly really either way. I also don't feel strongly. So Becky doesn't feel strongly. Attorney's not strongly. I'm not strong. So I, yeah, Alex, you seem to feel pretty opinionated. So I, actually, I mean, you're you're kind of swaying me to. Go. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy to go with the. Unless Teal, you want to add anything? I'm I'm happy to. I guess I sort of lean towards Alex. Your thought then, ultimately, since we're I think we're all kind of wishy washy a little bit on this. Right. I think it'll give weight to the things that have been most vetted by tab, most vetted by staff, and the public's had opportunity to, to weigh in on. And then if we're so fortunate to get the fourth with money that's that's left over, we can see what happens. If there's nothing else, all those in favor of the motion? Unanimous with five votes. And Meredith, I can email you the motion language. Do we second it? Would you do that properly? We get that I all? seconded, yes. That's right. Okay. 20 minutes ago. 
<laughs> okay. Sorry, that was so excruciating. I feel like I made that excruciating. <laughs> Uh, we're all in that one. Um, yeah, th thank you, Valerie and staff. I, I'm glad we, at one point, we were going to do this back in May. Um, so many of these projects, three out of the four that we just voted on weren't even on the menu back then. We've shaved millions of dollars off of other ones, improved safety, even, even the projects that we're not going to go after now, like the 28th Street multi-use path. We, we changed the alignment there, shaved some costs off, and um, I think we'll be better situated to to look at uh, 30th and, and Arapaho when, when that design uh, progresses in the, in the coming years. So but thank you for being such a collaborator with Tab on that. And Alex, I just like to add, I mean, and I know you guys are probably aware of this grant, but um, the applications just came out for a um, National Safety Council grant that might be able to aid. It's not 800, but it's 200. So it could help. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm, I put in the link on the chat. So if you guys want to check it out, if you're not aware of it, which I'm sure you are, but just thought I'd chuck that in there. Thanks, Jenny. Maybe whatever we can get. <laughs> All right. So with that, we'll move on to agenda item five, which is a staff briefing and tab feedback on the shared micromobility program. And I see David Kemp's here for that update. Welcome Great. To thanks. I'll get things rolling here. Let's see here. Okay, I assume everyone can see my presentation screen? Yes. Great. Excellent. Well, good evening, Tab. I'm DK, Senior Transportation Planner, and it's great to be back with you all this evening. We have a lot of information to share with you this evening regarding the key findings from the shared e-scooter evaluation report as well as some preliminary next steps to formalize the program in 2023. We look forward to addressing any questions following the presentation. Before we jump into the details of the e-scooter evaluation report, it's important to revisit the overall goal of the shared micromobility program, which consists of both e-bikes and e-scooters. Our goal is to provide safe, equitable, and sustainable forms of transportation that improve quality of life, provide connections to transit and key destinations, and replace motor vehicle trips to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Before we initiated the shared e-scooter pilot program, staff identified several criteria by which we would measure the efficacy of the program. All these criteria were evaluated during the pilot program, but with a special emphasis on safety and sustainability, as these criteria were still, were and still are of very high importance. And here's where we are in terms of the overall shared e-scooter evaluation process. In 2020, City Council directed staff to include e-scooters in the shared micromobility program, but in a limited service area east of 28th Street with the intention to test e-scooters and, and to determine if they are in fact a good fit for Boulder. Since then, we've selected a vendor, Lime, through a request for proposal process. And on August 17th, 2021, we launched the pilot program. Staff has collected data and community input over a one year time period, and we've been sharing the key findings with several community stakeholders over the past month and a half. Following TAB and City Council, we'll begin to finalize proposed next steps for the program and begin to incorporate any changes in early 2023. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the key findings from the shared e-scooter evaluation report. Since the start of the program, staff has been observing the operational aspects, and it has been a mix of both good and bad results. On one hand, the shared e-scooters have proven to be a new, convenient form of transportation for people to get to work, school, and to shop and run errands. And on the other hand, e-scooters have had a negative impact on people also using sidewalks and multi-use paths, and particularly those people with disabilities. The next few slides will further explore what we've been hearing, who's using e-scooters today, and some general utilization statistics. This past September, the city of Boulder administered a questionnaire and over 1,000 people responded. We summed up the major themes we've heard from the questionnaire, a Lyme customer questionnaire, numerous inquirable reports, 
as well as direct feedback to staff. In addition to the issue of impeding sidewalks and multi-use paths, people have also witnessed e-scooters abandoning creeks and ditches and observed unsafe riding behaviors and have expressed concerns that unorganized parking of e-scooters have added clutter to many neighborhoods. But there's also an appreciation for shared e-scooters as they provide a new alternative to driving and they are considered a more convenient mode of transportation, which are also fun to ride. Today, Lime has 40,000 unique customers in the Boulder market alone. Their customers are on the average age of 31 years old, and most of them live in households earning less than the medium, median income level. This could be attributed to a high number of college age students using the program. There also seems to be an equal split of people enjoying the recreational value of e-scooters and those people using e-scooters for utilitarian purposes. Okay, now let's look at some of the general stats. At the start of the program, 200 e-scooters were deployed and through a demand-based cap formula, Lime now has 300 e-scooters operating in East Boulder. A demand-based cap helps to regulate the overall number of e-scooters in a market, ensuring there is sufficient supply for people wishing to use an e-scooter for their journey. Over the course of the pilot program, 115,000 trips have been generated, equating to over 117,000 miles traveled. And as you can see, e-scooter trips are generally short, about one mile. We estimate that 25% of e-scooter trips displace motor vehicle trips. This estimation is based on a statistically valid survey administered by Lyme in 2019. The resulting greenhouse gas savings is approximately 26,000 pounds, which is equivalent to about 100, well, sorry, 1,300 gallons of gasoline consumed. As for safety, through the review of CU Boulder and City of Boulder police records, our data shows that there were four crashes involving moderate to severe injuries. In all four cases, the injured person was transported to the hospital via ambulance. And because the safety criteria is such an important criteria of the pilot program, let's take a deeper dive. Based on nas early national shared e-scooter crash data, we saw less than what we thought we would see. We think this is due to several contributing factors one being the durability of the e-scooters have greatly improved since 2018. More people have become familiar with e-scooters based on experiences elsewhere. The city of Boulder has a robust and maintained network of walk and bike infrastructure. And most drivers do have a greater awareness of vulnerable road users due to Boulder's already high number of people walking, biking, and now scooting. That said, operational challenges still remain for people walking and for people with disabilities using sidewalks and multi-use paths. And although, no, and although no crashes have been recorded, people riding shared e-scooters and pedestrians during the pro pilot program, there's still a perceived risk, which could lead to people choosing not to use these facilities due to fear of getting hurt. Now let's take a closer dive at the mode shift. It's clear from the responses in the questionnaire that shared e-scooters maybe be may be displacing motor vehicle trips. In fact, nearly half of all e-scooter trips appear to have done so. However, active transportation trips are also impacted. Nearly 30% of respondents said that they would have walked if an e-scooter was not available. It's evident that e-scooters provide a faster means to get to a destination over walking, and there is certainly the convenience factor. We also ask people where they normally ride an e-scooter. Bike lanes and multi-use paths are very popular, and some people indicated sidewalks. Staff wanted to know why people are riding e-scooters and sidewalks, since it, it is illegal, that is, unless there's no adjacent bike facility in the street, then they may do so. So here are the top three reasons. Generally, people feel unsafe because of vehicular traffic, speeds, and volume. There's the convenience of being able to travel bi-directional on one side of the street to access destinations from there origination. And sometimes they don't have a bike facility in the street that they can use. Okay, now let's shift our attention to overall utilization. 
We also examine utilization in other identified zones in the city, such as Boulder's racial equity zones, employment centers, CU Boulder's campuses, being East Campus in Williams Village, and Gun Barrel. But for the sake of time, I will not be covering those uh, areas in tonight's presentation. However, if any questions do arise uh, regarding those areas um, after the presentation, we are prepared to speak to those. This heat map represents all routes traveled within the East Boulder service area. And as you can see, e-scooters have penetrated all parts of East Boulder and they've been ridden on nearly every street and multi-use path. The dark purple corridor running north-south is 30th Street. And here's a look at chip starts. The dark purple polygons indicate high activity levels. And as you can see, all focus areas are in these zones. If I showed you a trip ends map, it would look very similar to this map. In that most trips are under one mile. 29th Street Mall is a major destination and in indicating shared e-scooters may induce some economic activity, connecting people to goods and services. There's also a high number of trips being taken between CU Boulder campuses and to the 28th Street East Boulder boundary to reach the main campus. Okay, this is the final section of tonight's presentation. Uh, the key findings from the evaluation report and community input to date has informed a preliminary set of proposed next steps to guide the transition from the pilot phase to a formal program. Let's begin. Here are the initial program areas we think comprise the foundation of our next phase of the shared e-scooter program. We are exploring service area expansion, mandatory designated parking zones, improved safety efforts, transportation demand management tactics to increase ridership, specific policy and accessibility elements to optimize the program for a disadvantaged community, and finally, ways in which we can use the collected fees to, to support the program moving forward. Expanding the program citywide is a proposed next step, but to do so in a manner that exercises a strategic and coordinated approach with stakeholders in Boulder's sensitive areas, such as Pearl Street Mall and University Hill. Staff will also continue coordinating with CU Boulder as they deem the appropriate steps necessary to continue expansion on CU's main campus. These identified dismount zones for downtown and University Hill were recently adopted by City Council during update to the Boulder Revised Code in 2019. These areas may provide an initial roadmap to creating the restricted riding zones. And to address many of the concerns associated with improperly parked e-scooters in sensitive zones like Pearl Street Mall and University Hill, staff is proposing the designation of mandatory designated parking zones consisting of both on and off street signed and marked facilities. Coordination with stakeholders on these locations will be imperative to the success of this strategy. And this next slide provides an example of what these designated parking areas will look like. The one on the left is at CU Boulder. And the one on the right is in the city of right away where we've been experienced uh, experimenting with on street um, lime groves. Okay. Safety is paramount and we believe these next steps will continue to improve safety and existing operational challenges. I'd like to highlight just a few. One being to eliminate those impacts to people with disabilities on sidewalks and multi-use paths. We'd like to create a culture of safety and courtesy on our multi-use path system through signing, marking, and safety education efforts. And we need to ramp up the safety education messaging through special events and social media campaigns. From a TDM perspective, there's great potential to integrate memberships for people living and working within the three of the city's general improvement districts, as well as student membership programs with CU Boulder and Naropa.
And in terms of policy and accessibility, there's more work and coordination to be done to optimize the program for people living in traditionally underserved neighborhoods, such as San Lazaro, San Juan del Centro, and Orchard Park. Through continued coordination with the city's Connectors and Residence Program, we aim to remove barriers to access Lyme's affordability program and increase overall utilization stemming from all racial equity zones in Boulder. And then the city has been collecting license and per ride fees and to date has amassed over $20,000 from, e from shared e-scooter operations. Combined with revenue from B-Cycles license and per trip fees, the city will determine appropriate expenditures to support and advance the overall shared micromobility program in 2023. Okay, and to conclude my presentation, let's circle back to where we are in the overall process. We are currently in the phase of taking input from boards, commissions, and council on proposed next steps, which will then consolidate and finalize and put into action in the first quarter of 2023. Thank you for your time tonight. We have uh, a few questions before you here. Uh, we'd like to know if you've had any observations from the pilot program that you'd like to share. And we do appreciate any suggestions to refine the e-scooter program as we go delve into next steps. Thanks, DK. Anyone have any observations or suggestions or clarifying questions? I have a few questions, is that okay? Thanks, great, thanks DK. Thanks for the presentation and all the materials. Um, I'm in general very supportive of, of the program. So um, I just have a few questions if I could just to try to understand a little better. Um, so on next steps, and I apologize if I missed this, but um, do, what's the, is, is the general idea as far as formalizing into a bigger program? Is, is there expansion in terms of, of area and and number of vehicles? And if so, can you just summarize that? And I, I'm sorry if I missed this. No problem. Uh, Ryan, a lot of that's to come. There's still a lot of okay. uh, talks to to be had in terms of what the phasing of the you know the rollout the expansion looks like. What we need to do in in East Boulder um, to bring that up to par. Um, what are the ideal number of scooters that we would have? And so through continued coordination with Lime and also our stakeholders, we'll, we'll come up with those uh, details mm -hmm. as we move forward. Okay, got it. Um, and then also I, I see some of the um, data on 47% uh, of respondents would have taken a car, if not the scooter, e-scooter. Um, sounds reasonable. I'm just curious if, if we've had a chance yet to be able to... Um, describe impact on mode or mode shift goals? Like, are we at that far yet or is it hard to, I'm just like kind of roughly, or is it sort of haven't had a chance to do that yet? Well, the, the mode share goals in the TMP right now um, for SOV trips within the city is actually going down, it's under 50%. However, um, it's some of the regional trips that haven't budged much, um, which are up there in the uh, high 70s still. So right. So my question is: is the is the impact the impact of the scooter program on mode shift on um, mode shift progress? Do we have that? Like, do we know what what share of the wedge the scooter program is on mode shift? Or and it's fine if the answer is no. I'm just, just curious. Yeah, we'd have to come back to that and, and do that analysis. Don't have that information tonight. Sorry, Ryan. Ryan, okay. I will know. I, I forget if it was eighty or eighty eight percent, but the vast majority of these of users are local here. Um, so they're not regional and commuters, except for, you know, 10 to 20%. Um, yeah. So my, my guess is uh, that helps answer your question too. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would, I would stipulate the, I, I, I believe these are reducing car dust. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious how excited I should be. Like, how, like, should I be excited or should I be really excited? Um, I'd like to be really excited. So I look forward to the data when that's, when that's ready. But yeah, I mean, this, so um, I'm just trying to understand the data a little better. I guess one more question then, DK. Um, just on the on the uh, equity and the racial equity category, I lost my place here, but um, I I think I saw two things I was curious about. One, um, that participation was relatively low on the was it like the low income program, um, and I was just curious if there's any like hypotheses or ideas about like 
what's going on there. And maybe this is like the point of the next stage is to work on that more, but I'm just curious if you have any, um, if you have any, I don't know, anything to share on that. You know, we have some ideas, but I really don't want to make any assumptions at this point. I think it's really going to take some some more in-depth work with our community uh, connectors program and and working with those communities a bit further to figure out, you know, what those all those barriers actually are. We have some ideas, but. OK, OK, thanks. Thanks for the clarifying questions. I appreciate it. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Tony. So all I wanted to say to Gabe, well, thank you for your presentation. And I am just so grateful to hear that there's going to be a change on how these um, the Lime scooters are docked. I know that it's a huge concern for the community that there, there's there been lots of places where I've read where people are just like, they're even annoyed about how the, the students or whoever's riding them at that particular time leave the scooters all over the place. And I think that will help and fix the problem and even the upkeep for the scooters long term will be a better thing right so i just wanted to point that out because i think that's really important thank that's you true. yeah no one else Tila? hi thanks dk that was um i the, the memo was a lot of fun to read the, the draft report is looking really interesting um I was curious if you could tell us a little bit more uh, of the backstory behind, you know, when we were trying to decide whether to do the pilot and where to do the pilot, we did not have a firm answer from CU about whether they were going to allow them. Um, clearly they did because we have data on their usage in Willville and, you know, all kinds of other places that are campus. Um, so can you explain a little bit about what, what you know about how the university arrived at the same kind of decision that we did? And do you have feedback whether the universities planning to continue or expand or modify its its program or where it's yeah, allowed. It's, sure, campus. absolutely, Tila. I mean, as you recall, it was uh, city council that asked us to try this in the East Boulder mm -hmm. area. And uh, and CU was really following our lead in terms of where we'd launch this. And, and at first, um, CU was somewhat adamant about having um, e-scooters on their campuses. Um, and so um, staff internally there at CU uh, worked with their um, leadership to allow, to try it out, to experiment uh, with e-scooters on the, um, the East Boulder, sorry, the East Campus and also Williams Village. Um, you know, when we were directed to initiate the program, uh, we were asked to go completely dockless. And, uh, and so, but e-scooter, or sorry, CU made the decision to go directly to a designated parking area situation, which was really interesting to watch because we collected a lot of data from CEO on how it was operating at the university. And they've maintained that, um, that status quo there of, of having the more of the docked system, if you will, using virtual stations. And, um, and so since then, they, they have also been um, experimenting with bringing the scooters over to main campus and have Mm -hmm. um, installed three new stations. So um, administratively, we're, we're able to make changes to the e-scooter program without going to council. Um, and we were making those changes based upon the, the need. And so we made an administrative decision to um, allow e-scooters to advance on the main campus, crossing that um, 28th Street border to, to see the effect, to see if those trips would be made all the way to campus. And it's been um, so far successful according to CU Boulder. Okay, good. That's that's good information. Thanks. Um, uh oh, oh, I had the other question in mind. Um, uh -huh. It'll come to me in just a like tomorrow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, B cycle. Have have you? It looks like you've done a lot of outreach and feedback from uh, a bunch of different businesses in the area and groups. Um, what does B cycle think about this? I note that most of the trips are about a mile. It, it was remarkably consistent across all of these areas. Um, and we think the B cycle trips are usually longer, but I was just curious whether we've heard anything from them about how they think that this, this the e-scooter availability has affected the B cycles core business. You know, they're both kind of serving two different niches. Mm -hmm. So the, so the bike trips are a little bit longer, you know, they're over a little over two miles. Right now, um, B cycle is experiencing exponential growth right now, and e a lot has, a lot has to do with <laughs> e bikes, yes, yep. and then also the membership program at CU Boulder, and uh, and so 
there, you know, because it's a doc system, we don't, we don't really have any complaints around the system um, other than I can't find a bike or this, this bike is out of juice and, you know, and they've been working so hard to, to keep up with demand. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, when we did the RFP process, um, both B-Cycle and Lime went in together on their RFP to complement to complement each other. And to date, I think it's working pretty good. You'll see sometimes we've got deployment zones that have both uh, the, the docked B-Cycle bikes and we've got the um, e-scooters parked, you know, nice, you know, right, ne right next to the station mm -hmm. there. And so um, I think they've been complementing each other well. Um, and there seems to be, like I said, a, a niche for both. And, and and when I think about combining, you know, the trips that have, because, you know, right now there really hasn't been a lot of, too much space for Lime to operate. And we talk about what that mode shift has, that effect on mode shift. When I start to think about the kind of citywide expansion plus B-cycle, the overall shared micromobility, I think that's when we're really going to be able to take those numbers and see how it is affecting our overall mode shift and displacing those motor vehicle trips um, altogether, and and also the greenhouse gas savings. It's going to be neat to factor those in as we move forward, and we can report back on what those findings are. Okay, um, I I'm pretty familiar with the geographic limitations on where the pilot was. I definitely encourage us to to open it up to larger areas of the city as we move forward. Just want to be on the record on that. I was never a huge fan of <laughs> keeping them you know, restricted to 28th Street and further east. Was there a northern limit where they operate? Right, it's J Road. It is J, okay. Yep, up to the city. Because I am seeing, there. you know, I'm looking at the heat map. Um, it's fascinating. I love the graphics in this um, report, the presentation. Um, but I'm looking at the heat map and there is quite a bit above J. Yeah. Oh no, there. Yeah, just a little bit. But uh, what what really stands out to me is that um, Valmont is heavily traveled. Thirtieth um, Street, of course, is the the star of the show. But there's almost no or very little use on Iris, and that is, I think, reinforcing how unpleasant uh, Iris Avenue is for travel in any mode other than in a, a motor vehicle of some kind. So if people are following the rules, they're expected to be in that bike lane on Iris because there is a bike lane there and not use the sidewalk. Um, I'm pretty confident that most of the users of these on Iris would be on the sidewalk anyway, notwithstanding the rules. But um, it's really that heat map is showing us that this is kind of a no-go zone, even though um, there's a, there are still a lot of users going all the way up to Iris, you know, from 30th Street um, and other places. So to me, it just reinforces the urgency of, of correcting IRIS. Um, it's rightfully in our, you know, CAN priority um, network, but I wanna use this as another data point for saying we need to fix this sooner rather than later. Well, just to be clear too, that IRIS, um, you know, east or west of 28th Street is not included in the current boundary. Um, and, and so I'm not sure what, what part are you seeing, but maybe not along yeah iris. i'm looking at the heat map from iris from 28th all the way over to i guess it would be 47th oh, okay um, got it got it yeah there's there's almost no nobody over there um, compared to the other east west corridors and sometimes it also has to do with what destinations are out there so obviously you know where people are going and what the attraction is mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely has an effect on where people want to go <laughs> so yeah, well, for some of these other destinations, I'm having a hard time figuring out what the heck would be that far out on Belmont, for instance. So I hear you, but. <laughs> well, there's actually quite a bit of uh, travel in between a lot of our underserved communities. That's right. So yep. folks coming from San Lazaro over to San Juan, San Juan del Centro or mm -hmm. Orchard Park, there was actually quite a bit of interplay um, there along um, Belmont. So yeah, this is just fascinating data. So thank you for this. I really You're love, welcome, Tila. Thank I you. love seeing this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so other than uh, encouraging you to, you know, continue, I, I find these results really um, encouraging. I do think user behavior paired with, you know, the financial incentives for misusing your Lime scooter are going to help curb some of the, the negative impacts that we are seeing. Um, and overall, I think that um, the, the safety, we, we, if we are shifting people from private vehicles onto scooters, uh, just the safety benefits from them not menacing other people on the road is, is pretty significant. Um, I recognize there have been a couple of crashes. I'm curious whether the person who was um, impaired, uh, like I think he was drunk maybe, 
from what I saw in the report, um, who suffered a head injury, uh, whether that was before or after the innovation that Lyme has with a little sobriety test before you can check one of these things out. I mean, what a great idea. Like if, if we could do half of these measures <laughs> for motor vehicles that we are employing to make these Lyme scooters safer, we would have much safer communities overall. Um, I think my only other comment, it, uh, when we were talking earlier um, before the pilot or wondering about how geofencing worked, we got some really rosy predictions about how precise the geofencing could be. And so I was surprised and a little dismayed to see in the graph report that at the moment, it's not accurate enough to tell whether the scooter is on a bike lane on a street or on the sidewalk. Um, I would absolutely prefer that they be allowed to be used on the street. Um, you know, the north south corridors from uh, like 9th to 19th. I think the memo said 7th, but 7th doesn't go through. Um, but to assume uh, but that these scooters are being used on the on the road where it kind of feels safe and secure and, you know, it's, it's not hectic. Uh, but rather than have them disabled throughout the entire area, I think we can treat them more or less as we are treating bicycles um, in those sensitive um, pedestrian dense areas and just, you know, trust the people sort it out. I guess maybe I'm being Pollyannish that way, but <laughs> again, it's better than motor vehicles. If not being able to use it to get to Boulder Bookstore is a disincentive to going there at all, uh, you know, I would rather assume that they're gonna, they're gonna use the, the road um, to get there and allow e-scooters to be used in that, in that downtown area. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, I really, yeah, uh, it's great, uh, great results to see and I'm excited about the direction of everything. Um, and as Teal had noted, um, some of the streets that uh, are most heavily traveled are in our CAN network, which I think is always, it's also really, um, uh, great to see that you know those that will we can expect even more ridership I, you know, with the improvements that are coming um, to some of those arterials. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I, want, I have a question, uh, maybe just kind of a background question about the dismount zones. Um, so does this mean if somebody is riding on the sidewalk, they'd have to dismount? Because okay, and right. on those streets. Yes. Okay. okay, thanks. Uh, but they could be outside of those areas technically. Right. So okay. essentially that shaded yellow area was basically where all bikes and scooters, skateboards um, must, you know, you must dismount in those zones. And you'll see the, you'll see the decals on the, on the pavement indicating, you know, which sections of sidewalk are, are dismount zones. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I noticed them on the Pearl Street Mall, but I guess I didn't notice that <laughs> previously, kind of in the areas around. But now you'll start um, seeing them everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure. I'm sure, that they're there. It's kind of registered to me. Um, uh, I had a question. I was just curious about the survey, the um, uh, the note about allowing access to shared e scooters past hours of operation for people working in the service industry. I'm just curious how that how that works or how that would might work um, if they're yeah. Well, if they're tied to a membership program, it'll be um, we're capable of, you know, discerning who is, you know, part of that membership program and who isn't and what now. So some of those details will be worked out as we move forward if we're able to create these membership programs and our GIDs. But um, man, it seems like with this technology right now, so much can be done. Uh, except for the preciseness of the geofencing. That's kind of the one thing. But from an operational perspective, you know, we can slow these things down in certain areas. We can turn them on for some folks who have certain membership um, options and and whatnot. So there's a lot of things we can do, um, and we'll work through those details as we as we roll it out. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then my other questions, I'm just really curious about the the parking potential. Um, uh, I could it be well? I guess my first question is how like if you know, decide to go ahead with adding more designated scooter parking spaces. Um, what is the role of transportation and community vitality together in that? Or who, like, how does, how would that work? I guess, how would that Partnership. Work? <laughs> okay. Definitely, and <laughs> in, in, yeah, and definitely in the, the downtown area and, you know, and what that looks like with curbside management um, and integrating those um, parking areas. But, you know, you know, right now we're looking at 
you know, areas around the peripheral of the downtown dismount zone where we'd have those parking um, zones and looking at both on and off streets. And, and that's all still to be determined as well as we as we move forward. But obviously, most definitely, you know, coordination between our two departments. OK, thanks. And then so that would be the, the first kind of target area would be right outside those dismount zones. Or is there also consideration for the like other parts like throughout the city? Is that all kind of? No, I think we're taking this approach um, citywide and we're developing criteria to identify those candidate areas. And then we'll go into the, um, the stakeholder outreach and talking about where these things would go. And, um, you know, there's a there's a lot to it when you start to designate, you know, some of these on street and off street areas and who's affected and whatnot, especially, you know, with local businesses and whatnot. But no, I think there are some neighborhoods, too, that could benefit from um, having designated parking areas. Um, it's good. A lot of the complaints that we've received from folks are in those um, residential areas and not so much in the, um, you know, the activity centers today, but kind of on the outskirts and, and whatnot. So. OK, thanks. Um, and I'm curious because I've seen um, I've seen bike parking used as a way to daylight intersections. And I'm wondering if this scooter parking could could have that sort of. Um, function as well and then also be serving you know even even greater purpose that's a great idea absolutely i know exactly what you're talking about okay um yeah and that might for folks who are wary of losing a car parking space might also be a <laughs> helpful there's a safety um, benefit there right? <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly so improving the experience for lots of road users um and then the other uh, my my one other thought is just um uh this is um kind of from my own <laughs> perspective of where i live but i'd love i'd love to think about um parking spots where there's like a lot of multifamily housing housing um and so potentially like a lot of users within you know a short distance of um of like a, a scooter parking area um that seems like just a good a good potential kind of data point to use is just kind of the density residential density yeah that's a great point but, absolutely that could be one of those criteria that we would use to identify this location is, you know, the, the density of the housing in the area. Great. Well, thanks. Um, those are all questions I have. Thank you, Becky. Thanks. Any more feedback on this item? Alex, I have, I have my feedback. Earlier I asked questions. Now I have, I have some feedback. All right, okay. Um, DK, thank you again, and congratulations on a successful pilot. I think one thing that jumps out is um, this was a this was a complete unknown what like a year year and a half ago, and um, now we've done this, and yeah, there's some complaints here and there, but I mean, you've, we've rolled this whole thing out, and it's it's incredibly exciting. So um, well done, and I'm really glad to see that it's it's going to move forward and ex hopefully expand. Um, I I think that okay, just a, a few points then from there. Um, I see in the data, there's just an incredible amount of demand for mobility options besides cars. I see 115,000 trips in the year. So per day, that's about 315. Um, and I'm, I guess half-ish of those are probably were, were um, car replacement trips. So 150, 160 car trips in the city per day not being taken. Um, and 117,000 miles in total, half of that again, miles of 60, 50, 60,000 trips or miles in the city uh, avoided by car. I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, and this is in a, the, a relatively less dense part of the city, if you look at the map, uh, if we look at the map. So, um, you know, it's just sort of funny looking at the heat map. It just gets, it gets really purple and then it stops because of the geo fence. So let's open that up. Um, there's there's a clearly a, a, a huge amount of demand. Um, with this, we are, we are, I don't know if we're doubling or what the, the factor is, but we're increasing the number of, of people who need more um, safe infrastructure. So we need to, we need to, you know, build that out and um, as we do it. And I think um, I would just off advise that when we think about council in, you know, with tab, tab advising council, this is the kind of thing that, you know, you can sort of, sort of a Rorschach test of, of what you see here. And I think it's, um, easy to think about you know if you if you're um i, I don't know it's, it's it would be easy to be fretful about opening up to more scooters and more dense parts of the city but i i think um 
it's exactly what we should be doing. And, and that's because this is a core component of an overall multimodal system. And um, we, of course, do need to build out more safety support infrastructure as, as we do it. Um, so I would just um, hope that we could, you or we, Tab, will carry the message to council that, you know, this isn't just scooters. This is part of a, an integrated system that we need to build um, if we are to realize our our um, various TMP goals and, and other equity goals or related goals in the city. So um, those are my observations. Um, well done. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, DK. Not seeing anything else. So I think we'll move on to matters. Not only are there any matters from staff, yeah, thanks, Alex. I had a um, late edition that I missed on uh, before we published the agenda. So I appreciate you asking. Um, so I just wanted to provide an update on the um, sustainability and resilient strategy report that Chautauqua released. Um, well, they sent it via email to the board on October 25th. Um, and I just wanted to provide a brief update on that because I, some of you may have received that and thought like, what is this? <laughs> Where did it come from? Um, so we've been, the city has been working with Chautauqua on this um, effort for uh, a couple of years. And I mean, there was COVID and such. So I think we've kind of lost track of time, but it's it's been a while that we've been working on it. Um, and it's been a uh, an effort across the whole organization. There were folks from PNDS and climate initiatives um, and utilities and transportation all kind of involved in the process. Um, and I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at the report, but it's basically a strategy document and includes conceptual um, recommendations around infrastructure, including transportation infrastructure upgrades. Um, so just for kind of where things are at to date, we're, we're still um, kind of reviewing what's in that document and we'll be evaluating and prioritizing the recommendations for programming um, in the future and future CIPs. Um, but that work is still kind of TBD. We, we haven't started that work. We are um, just starting to get our kind of resources aligned to identify a project manager. Um, that I think is coming out of the city manager's office to help us do that next phase of work to prioritize the projects that are within that report. But it really is you know, cross-cutting from utilities projects, transportation projects, climate initiatives projects. So um, we'll certainly be back with future information and future updates on that. But I just wanted to give you just a brief summary of kind of where that came from and um, that there will definitely be more in the future that you all will be plugged into. Awesome. Yeah, I skimmed that report. It was interesting to learn about what, what else got on there. Any other matters from staff or questions on that item? Nothing more so, for me. Thanks, Alex. Cool. All right, we'll move on to matters from the board. The first thing is, is the our opportunity to weigh in on the recruitment questions for the 2023 tab applications. And I'd appreciate some clarity from staff here. Are we just being asked for broad feedback? Should we be wordsmithing? What level of feedback would be most appreciated? Um, so I can chime in with kind of my thoughts and then Meredith, um, feel free to as well. And I'm, I imagine others just on tab might have a recollection of the history and how you guys have um, kind of informed the, the development of the questions. Really, from my understanding, um, each board kind of deals with these differently. Some boards, um, you know, revise them and have something that they would like to contribute to how the questions are asked or framed. Other boards just kind of leave it to staff to deal with. Um, so we wanted to just provide it as an opportunity if TAP wanted to weigh in on the questions, um, but there's no prescribed process for this citywide. Cool, and by chance- Did I get, the oh, sorry, questions. did I get that right, Meredith? 
Could you by chance display the questions? Oh, yes. Do you want me to put them up or do you have a Meredith? I can work on it. I think that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't have them open. I have minutes open, sorry. Oh, no worries. Uh, while they're coming up, has, has anyone on tab who's read them have any feedback? Tila? Um, I like the change to number six. Um, what personal experience do you have that can lend to advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion on the board? Um, this question, probably about four years old now, but was basically what can, what personal experience do you have that can lend diversity of thought, I think was how it be, first began. Uh, but this is much more uh, focused on um, DEI issues, which I think is an appropriate place to pivot and kind of a better way to ask the question than we were trying to. Uh, and what can we do differently to make transportation investments that serve historically underserved community members is a really good, like give us some bright ideas kind of question. Um, the proposed question nine, I think is um, almost too big in reach because it's sort of asking, <laughs> okay, smart guy, what, <laughs> how would you fix our you know, like budget shortfall? <laughs> I think we've had multiple working groups think about multiple times. Um, it's, uh, it's basically saying uh, since maintenance costs keep going up, uh, we, um, our funding sources stay pretty much flat, we're losing chances to build any enhancements. And so how, what is your approach to continuing to meet our transportation goals while balancing the competing needs for limited resources? I, that's just a, such a big question that I'm not sure we would get very, um, certainly not focused answers, but it's probably not very useful answers. Um, we might be better ask, you know, what kinds of considerations should be more important or less important when we're trying to, to figure out what to do with competing needs for limited resources. But I just think the question as it's phrased is just too giant. It was, it was about as bad as the question we tried to replace it with, um, with, the, with the number eight that's been crossed out. Um, which was something like, how do you resolve regional in commuting problems or something, you know, huge like that. So I would just shy away from asking such a giant, giant scope of a question and be a little bit more targeted in what we're asking them to, to assess and to suggest. Do I have the right ones up that you're- Yes, yep, okay. that's it, yep. I agree, Tila. I think I would try to keep one question per question and keep the questions not too advanced where someone who spends a bunch of time on the CIP could maybe answer that question, but we're not excluding people who don't even know where to begin or haven't had the time to begin. So I would, general feedback would be keep them a little broader, one question per, and then on the last one, um, kind of implies we've achieved, we're achieving our TMP goals. I think we're maybe phrase that towards how could we make progress towards our, our TMP goals? Cause we're, um, we're not there yet for a, a vision zero city, especially. Any other feedback? I, I probably waited too much last time, but I'll, the general comment I'd offer is I agree, I agree with um, what I've heard. And I think now thinking about it with another year, a year on, um, yeah, I think some of these, they're, they're so tech, they're kind of like techno, they're very techno focused and they, they kind of like, I think they, they, they imply that you should have, you know, we're looking for like, I don't know, technical folks, planners and engineers. And, um, and it would be nice if it was, I don't know, you sort of, sort of felt just like it was meant to be more inclusive to folks and asking a question about like, what are you excited about to bring to, to city of Boulder? What do, what do you think we need to do? And not, not tie it to like some specific goals that the city has, but just invite a more creative um, kind of approach. But now I hear I go, I guess I'm proposing more questions. So I don't know, I, I'm happy to just let it ride, but I, I do think it would be interesting to think about something that's just like, what do you, what do you want to offer? Thanks, Ryan. Anything else? Not seeing anything. 
staff, do you have enough from us on that? Yeah, can I stop share? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, thanks for pulling that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that works. We can certainly um, revise and pare back and simplify. Cool. Make it less technical, definitely. Awesome. Trini, want to tell us about the World Day of Remembrance? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Alex, for putting this on the agenda. It's really important to me as a traffic um, victim um, survivor. And so, yeah, I'm excited to say that last week, the official declaration was read at the city council meeting and Boulder recognizes November 20th as the World Day of Remembrance for traffic victims. Um, as events happen across the country throughout the week, our second annual event in Boulder will be held on November 19th, which is this coming Saturday, and is co-hosted co with It Could Be Me, the City of Boulder, and Dr. Cog. We will meet at 5 p.m. in front of the downtown courthouse. We will hear from our mayor, Aaron Brockett, Council Member Bob Yates, who was a victim of traffic violence himself last year, and members from our city staff, Dr. Cog, and a representative from Congressman the Goose. Immediately afterwards, we will begin a short memorial walk that will showcase buildings that are illuminated with a color yellow as a symbol of support and unity to the families of the people of our community that our community has lost. We will also have an art exhibit in the lawn in front of the courthouse to pay tribute to the 13 lives lost in Boulder County this past year. Um, I sent a little memo earlier, and that was meant for now. Um, there is this beautiful thing that they did in LA. Um, they have halos that are representing and kind of like what um, white bikes do for, for cyclists that are hit. Um, they have halos for pedestrian deaths. And so I thought it would be really cool to incorporate something like that. I'm trying to get a hold of the artist to see if we could do something similar. Obviously, we, we have very little time, but in the interim, we could do something fun. I mean, not fun, but something around that because I think it's really, really cool. Um, so I just want to thank, you know, it's been a pleasure to work with everybody on on this with the city, the, the transportation and mobility department, and especially David Kemp. He's been amazing um, and has worked so hard to make all of this happen. And so please, if you haven't thought about it, please come. Um, again, it's at 5 p.m. in front of the courthouse. I've heard back from Tila and Becky and Alex. I don't know, Ryan, if you can make it. We'd love to see you there. And I think I have to make it public since we would all be there. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know how the technicality of that as tab. Um, so works. we can ask our secretary to please publicly notice this event. Oh, thank you, Tila. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and then we can all go and we'll probably not talk much shop anyway, but just in case. Yeah. No, thank yeah. you. No, well, thank you guys so much for the time and, and hope to see you there Saturday. Thanks, Jenny. Hope I can make it. And it's impressive to see how big this is scaling up. I remember last year seeing some photos of it. And now you've got the mayor and the courthouse and all the buildings downtown. And that's uh should be really exciting to, to celebrate this. Um, any other comments under open board comments? Tila? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to to respond. We've gotten a couple of very well written, well reasoned, and concerned letters about uh, kids on Super Seventy Threes um, on these bikes that are not um, legal on our sidewalks, um, and probably that parents of <laughs> kids who are riding them are unaware of that fact. And just trying to, there's been a lot of hand wringing over community cycles as well about it. Um, and my thinking is that it would probably be a better message since these are generally school age kids that we are hearing um, communities and, and community members and school um, administrators concerned about if we could um, encourage BBSD to kind of come out with something official. So I'm reaching out to um, Landon Hilliard um, to see if he's open or able to, to craft a statement. But I think a message coming from principals to individual families of students is probably gonna be more effective than some citywide campaign. But I do recognize that um, that, that particular model of bike is, is really uh, popular. I've been attending middle school recently. And so I see them 
um, you know, write up and I actually see how the other students react to them when someone gets a new one. And um, it's, it's quite a thing. And I think it, it's one of the, um, one of the vehicles that we hadn't really anticipated when we were trying to come up with the, which wheels go where um, stuff that, that DK has referenced earlier in this meeting. So I'm, I'm hoping that BDSD will take the lead on this, but I just kind of wanted to flag it because it has come through our tab emails um, and you know should be a citywide concern as well. So just curious of any things happening on the staff side, but I honestly think BDSD is the best one to lead the charge on this. Um. So I, I'm going to have, I think Valerie has some background information she was going to share. Go ahead. Yeah, um, we just, we have at the ready that um, which wheels go where um, slide, if that would be helpful to put on screen for this discussion. DK, do you, you could bring that up real quick. Okay. And I was just going to say, as DK is bringing that up, um, we have seen some emails coming in to tab and council on this topic um and it's something that we're thinking about i appreciate you know your willingness to reach out to bvsd to um also kind of advocate for the safety around these devices and tila can i add something can you please address the fact that none of these kids are wearing helmets or the majority of them it's really I mean, if you're gonna address it with BBSD, I think it, it would be a good thing that parents are aware that, you know, it could save the kid's life. So I got a couple slides speaking about this. Um, it, yes, we've, we've been receiving some, uh, an uptick and growing concerns around certain types of um, e-vehicles, specifically the Super 73 and the Onyx and the Rad Power. There's a number of brands out there and these things can go up to 45 miles per hour in some cases. Um, and so um, a lot of activity around a lot of our schools, a, a lot of activity around Casey Middle School um, and the Ideal Shopping Center, um, we've seen some of that. Um, <clears throat> And that is, you know, exactly one of our things is to partner with the with the, the, the school district because that's a way in which we can reach those um, junior high students that are are using those. And so, um, whether it be a combined um, effort with TAB, I'm happy to do that. And I'll let um, Natalie and Tila work out the details of how you like staff's involvement um, and in working with you on this, but. Um, there's a lot more we can do, I think, at this point to to talk about where um, these things are allowed to ride and and then also um, some safety education messaging around them too. And so um, Valerie did mention the 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 wheel, which wheels go where. Let me see if I can pull that up here real quick. Um, one second. So this is the sorry. One second here. Now, as DK is looking for that, you know, I think the the market's changing so quickly with the different types of e-bikes um, and other devices that are out there, and um, some um, are able to be modified aftermarket. Um, you know, so there's a lot that we can also do as as what DK had just. Um, described and, and just helping educate people on the differences between the devices and what is currently allowed or not allowed and where. Um, and I think that's what DK was going to pull up is, is our existing materials on that topic. Yes, and I'm sorry about that. I'm working on it right here. Um, one sec. Here it comes. Okay. Thanks, DK. If I could uh, just request that you email it to me so I can kind of include that in my talk with Landon. Yeah. Are you um, able to see this slide? Yeah, here? I'm sorry. That, yeah. that was the same graphic on the other slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just, I had blown one. Yeah. And it, what it's not really yeah. talking about is what the difference between the like class two and class three is. And that's kind of, I think that's where we're at. And, and the aftermarket modification is an excellent point, Valerie. So um, I will say though, too, that we did actually provide um, guidance we changed the boulder revised code to address those types of vehicles right so i think it's a matter of updating some of this information and including those types of devices into this particular chart right here um, yep. which can be disseminated um you know 
throughout yeah. our partners. Yeah, but uh, honestly, uh, just getting it to the the drill sergeant parents is, I think, going to be <laughs> our most effective yeah. strategy. <laughs> so, Tila, if you need any, it, but I appreciate that. If you could send that to me, oh, is that in the um, the draft report? Uh, this, th yes, this one I think is in the draft report. Oh, um, I, okay, I didn't notice that page. Okay, yeah, well, but then big, I already big, have big it. No worries. Tila, I can go ahead and, and send you um, the overall final micromobility guide, which has you know all of the different devices right. and where they're allowed to operate, and then also it also has the specific BRC code associated with with each one. We call okay. it the micromobility guide, and I'll also send you okay. this clip. I, um, I would love that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to do this on behalf of Tab. I'm doing this as a you know as a drill sergeant mom, but. Um, just wanted to let you know that's it's been a concern and I wanted to make sure if anyone's you know watching this or checking in on you know has tab noticed those emails or you know what is the city doing just to say we're working on we're thinking about it and we're strategizing so okay that was all cool great I have, thank you I have a, I have thank a question you. in the future will there be like any specific um like any differentiation between the different types of e-bikes because obviously a bike that has a full throttle capacity is so different than one that has a pedal assist type of mechanism or you know motor I mean I don't know so would that be something that the city could consider perhaps classifying them in so at least the consumer is clear on what the expectation is I mean absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, there, there are the different classifications of the e-bikes today, class one, two, and three. And then we've got some of these things now that are outside of even that classification, in which are called um, low-powered electric bikes. And so and, and those right now are not allowed on, you know, sidewalks or multi-use paths, and it can be ridden in the street only at this point. Um, but I think providing what you're saying is providing some clarification around all these different clear, uh, classes and where they can be ridden today, uh, I think is um, important. Thanks. Tila, Tila, sorry to drag this on, but I, can I also, do, I guess I have a question. Um, so I, I, think, I think the point is to clarify to parents slash the district that class three, or I guess beyond class two vehicle e-bikes are, are problematic for young people. And, and that's, the, I think, and mod, I guess modifications too. Um, and I'm mean, using, so okay, so I think that seems fine. Uh, it, um, I, get, I get nervous because I, I think that e-bikes are such an important part of our, of our future system of getting people out of cars. And for those who aren't close to them, it's really easy to just sort of hear, oh, yeah, the e-bikes. Get rid of the e-bikes. And DK, I heard you say Rad Power. I don't know if Rad Power actually has a class. Yeah, three, I don't think that they go that that I'm, fast. I'm, I think this is a something we need, we need to be careful about um, that we're that we're not scaring people away from e-bikes, um, but rather saying, in fact, e-bikes are really important for our, our city's goals, and we'd like your kids to be coming to school. Well, maybe not your kids. Don't, Think about this, but the point is like we should have more e-bikes going to schools and less cars going to schools. Um, and there is a um, a problematic version. Um, and I suppose thirdly, I don't know about others, but like in my high school when I went to school, I, five kids died in cars and separate accidents. And I'd rather have in general have kids on bikes and you know in the city than being told they need to go drive cars. And I think there's um. You know, there's a, there's a lot of safety opportunity here to uh, to really encouraging um, teenagers to be taking alternatives to cars. So I know I'm preaching the choir in a lot of cases here, but I just want to express my concern about um, handing handing for the picking on this to BBSD, which may or may not have um, you know folks who are really thinking about it this way. Yeah, I, th I think DK expressed it really well just now by saying these are not e-bikes. This is a different class of vehicle, and that's probably something parents don't like recognize. So, can I suggest something, Tila? And I'll sure. be more than happy to work on this with you. Um, what if we suggest to BVSD a, a, a pamphlet or something that we can hand out mm -hmm. to to showcase what the differences are and making it something that is completely inviting, opposed to like just to support Ryan. I'm completely, right. with you. but. Um, but if you're not aware of the multiple, you know, 
the variety of e-bikes that are out there as a parent. And if you want to buy one for a child, you need to know, you know, what each of them is capable yeah. of. Yeah. So I think that would be really interesting. Maybe something in conjunction with a city. If you guys did something with BVSD, just to kind of. Yeah. Christmas well, shopping advice. Hey, Christmas is coming. You might want right? to. Right. <laughs> these items, not these ones. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of interest in this, and so I'll I'll report back and let you know how it goes. Um, but I, I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you for taking this on, Dila. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for thanks for leaving this. Any other matters from the board? Not seeing any. Uh, future agenda topics. Looks like we have a fairly busy December, as currently outlined. Uh, but as always, feel free to reach out to me if there's, if there's if there's anything you'd like added to the agenda, and we can work on that in the agenda setting meeting in a couple of weeks. And with that, we've completed the agenda. Can I please get a motion to adjourn? Any motions to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Few seconds. All those in favor? Thanks to Council Member Thanks. Spear. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.